All righty, everyone. Hello there in um, Meet the Ultimate Podcast Land. Um, good to have you on board for episode 30. Now, um, this is not Paul Shaw. You might recognize this quite annoying voice. Uh, it's Anthony Paharich here, uh, the CEO of Vix Premium Quality Meat. Um, no, I haven't sacked Paul Shaw, the usual host of Meet the Ultimate Podcast. Um, we're mixing it up. Um, we're doing something a little bit different here. Uh, the shoe's on the other foot. I'm actually going to be the interviewer and Paul's going to be the interviewed uh, for episode 30 of Meet the Ultimate, Ultimate Podcast. Um, Shori, welcome to your show. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on this side. And just, just to be clear, they're never interviews. They're always conversations. Conversations, okay. Yeah, so I don't want any Spanish Inquisition, man. This is my first right out. There's a box of tissues on the table. <laughs> Does that, is that meant to symbolize, symbolize anything or you're going to be all right? There won't be any teary moments? Or? You could cry, but it's okay, man. Anyway, a few sound effects. I can see a, a can I can see a can on the table here. It's a gift from me to you. That's oh, a gift to soften me up. Because I've so just I come out, hard. every other punter does dry July. I like to be in front and get it out of the way. I did dry June yeah. and <laughs> I discovered it because I love beer and it's fucking torture, man, not having a beer on a Friday night. or with you. So I found a bunch of different no alcohol beers and I've been trialing them all and there's this great one. Um that literally came in called Sober. Sober. Interesting name for a beer. Yeah, it's – it's Well, no alcohol. No alcohol. No, well, beer. it's got 0.4%. So you can have like 15 beers is the equivalent of one is the conversion. There's still a tiny little bit in there. It actually tastes – It's fucking good, Really man. good, yeah. It's really good. So there's a bunch of them and, and Maryvale that – we all know very well. They're, those guys are always ahead of the curve too. So this, they're, they've, I've been going to all of their venues more often than not because they've got not this one but um, a bunch of no alcohol beers in their pubs at Paddington and Newport and Fred's and it's good, man. Yeah, it tastes good. It tastes real good. Sober. We certainly won't be drunk at the end of um, this podcast. 0. 0.4 alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does it feel, mate, to be on the other side of the table? I'm a little bit nervous because you're a bit loose. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited because, you know, we had a chat about doing this and I think we've done 29 episodes before this and there's been some things that we've spoken about that I think we were working through the process of how it fitted into our philosophy and our business and I'm, I'm excited to be – ask questions about perhaps some of the backflips that I've done on my views on on certain things. Well, this is going to be an opportunity for everybody to sort of get to know you a little bit better. Uh, you are the host with the most and you've done a stellar job in terms of um, hosting. So we're 30 episodes in. Yep. Uh, episode 29 obviously sort of featured uh, Jake and Kenny, uh, which was amazing and we received uh, a load of um, great feedback on that podcast already uh, is this one's definitely not going to be as um, colourful in terms of language and 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 so forth. Maybe colourful in terms of um, um, you know stories and all that sort of stuff. No C bombs, I don't know. No it's certainly not the first five. <laughs> yeah, well done, boys. Um, how you doing? You good? Yeah, I'm. I'm good, yeah. man. New financial year, and you know we've had a tough time this this last six months, this last twelve months. The, the whole meat industry, the whole hospitality industry is is has been challenging. You know, I'm I'm new to the industry. You know, I've been We're gonna get to that. Yeah, yeah we'll but that. I've been in and around it, but typically drinking in bars and shit before I started working for you. So it's been a fascinating time to to join the industry when it's probably going through its 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 most challenging and potentially its most exciting times too. I'm um, just back on the podcast. Uh, you must be over the moon. Uh, this was your idea. Mm. Uh, you floated it with me um, seven or eight months ago. You must be over the moon with the feedback, the response. Um, how does it make you feel? Has it reached, you know, like how did you sort of think we were going to sort of go with this whole thing? I know it's a world that you've been in for a while and, yeah. and so forth. Like, um, I'm being super honest when I say this. I'm – unbelievably humbled by 
the amazing feedback that we've gotten, you know, Beef Central last week plugging it as as one of the most influential podcasts in meat in Australia, if not the world. And but it was always my intention with it that it was just a platform for us to give our amazing chefs, our amazing suppliers, people that had views that were pro meat, people that had views that were anti-meat and I didn't really know where it would go and and it's interesting to read some of the feedback of people that see the title meat and don't listen to it and then when they do listen to it realize it's so much more than meat so yeah mate I'm proud I'm proud to have the opportunity it's you know while it's it's not directly part of Vic's Meat or Victor Churchill or VMM it it has that same incredible proudness and quality uh, about it and we record it here in you know in our headquarters at, at mascot so yeah mate I'm, I'm humbled but also super stoked and we haven't done anything to to truly promote it yet so i'm i'm really interested to see how far it can go and how many people will change their view whatever that happens to be eat more eat less meat eat better quality you know, stop buying factory farming, question the whole plant-based hysteria that's out there because they've got a, a better understanding of all the implications, including to their health on, on things like that. What is it about podcasts as a medium to sort of communicate and, and, and so forth? What, what, what is it about podcasts that you love? What is it that you'd sort of say to somebody, you know, I mean, you got me hook, line, and sinker. You know, I'm I'm sort of addicted to listening to them. Yeah, beats sort of sitting in Sydney traffic and yeah. listening to Drake's latest single or whatever. <laughs> yeah. What is it about podcasts as a medium to sort of communicate and educate that you sort of love so much? Yeah, I that's a super easy one for me, AP. I think in this world where we're constantly distracted by our phones whether they're our mobile phones or our desk phones or people in our offices, in our workspace. It's the one opportunity that I'm afforded to sit down with incredible human beings and just have a conversation, a conversation that matters, a conversation that disarms people, but most importantly, a conversation that is uninterrupted, it's not distracted. It's probably the only time in my life that I don't think about other stuff. I don't look at my phone and things like that. And I, I think it's bringing really valid conversations, important conversations to people that typically wouldn't have had access to them. So, yeah, those two things, mate, it's just a, a really pure form of communication in a, in a very distracted world and it's disseminating information in a way that's free and able to get to you know i think there's like 85 different countries of listeners with our show and you know we're just a minion compared to some of the big ones out there nice um everybody knows you as the host of meet the ultimate companion you're the That's chief- your book man there's a podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. Meet the Ultimate Podcast. Sneaky. Is that yeah. a plug for the yeah, book? Yeah, another plug for the book, yeah. And slow sales are slowing, <laughs> people. <Get behind. laughs> Go and buy the book. Booktopia. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, everyone knows you as uh, – all our listeners know you as the the host of Meet the Ultimate Podcast. You're the Chief Commercial Officer of Extreme and Quality Meat. Yeah. Um, but for all the listeners out there, let's go to the beginning. Um, give them a bit of a, a background on who Paul Shaw is, your upbringing – where you went to school, your first job, mm. um, yeah, give give us a bit of a background yeah, in well, history. That's a that's a super big question. Um, I grew up on the Central Coast, was raised by two amazing human beings. My uh, mum and dad were both medical doctors. I had four siblings. We had this treasured upbringing of just surfing, football, walking to school. But very early, I got sent to boarding school because Central Coast for my parents was not an educational hub. It was there was way too many bong smokers and <laughs> delinquents for, for their conservative liking. So I came to Sydney very early and, you know, went to a privileged school in St. Joseph's College at, at Hunters Hill, which to be honest, I hated at the start, but I loved rugby and, you know, that kind of changed my ways and I still have a few good friends from from there. But 
I left school, started physiotherapy, and then I was dating a girl that told me you're going to be rubbing granny's groins for the rest of your life. And so <laughs> I quit. If that doesn't put you oh, off, nothing will. I say it was horrendous. <laughs> I still had that image in my mind. I left and then worked in the stock market in 1987. You know, like I'm giving away my age now. You know, I'm 50 and you know, rode that amazing as a young kid, like 18 years of age, was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald when, you know, Black Monday happened and and the stock market collapsed. And from there went back and, you know, because the whole industry collapsed and the firm I was working for shut down and, and decided I needed an education because that's what my parents raised us all to do. And so I went and did a economics degree with a uh, finance and business major at Sydney University. And from there, never went into corporate, you know, decided, didn't want to do it and got right into health and fitness and, and started a, a training and personal training business, doing a bit of corporate training too. And until after 10 years, I got really bored of that, you know, it was interesting, but wasn't that scalable and, and went back as a mature age student to Ernst & Young when I was, I think I was 30, 31 years of age. And Why, why though, Shuri, why finish with a pretty high-powered degree in finance yeah. and economics yeah. and not sort of use that skill set, go back into corporate, go back into banking, go back into merchant banking, stock breaking, whatever it might be? Why go out there and sort of start? It's a super interesting question because I was – when you're raised by doctors, you, the, there's only one thing those people know, like it's medicine and – and so I had no idea of what else to do, you know. And so when I finished my degree, I went and did a couple of interviews with some of the big accounting firms and I walked around because I'd worked in an office in the stock market in 1987 and it was exciting and things changed a lot. And I walked into some of those big accounting firms and looked around and it just looked like a bunch of hamsters on a hamster wheel and I just – I, I couldn't do it and I had this entrepreneurial spirit and, I, and so I started this training business. I started a cleaning business on the side. I started a promotion business on the side. Clueless, completely clueless, but, you know, made things work and and made money and it gave me autonomy and, uh, and it was fun for a while, but I, I didn't – I didn't have that pure entrepreneurial DNA to take it from – an idea into something really scalable. You know, it's something that you and I have spoken about. I think there are people that have entrepreneurial DNA and then I think there are pure entrepreneurs, those people that are prepared to work for 5, 10, 15 years, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, sacrifice family, health, the whole shooting match because it's their driving force. And and I realized that it wasn't me. So I didn't go into corporate because it it just looked super sterile. I had this entrepreneurial spirit, but I didn't have the, you know, the that that steely resolve to really make it work. And so I probably copped out a little bit, mate, and and you know, had open doors at, at Ernst and Young because I was teaching spin there. Mm. You know, and I met a couple of the partners and they liked me and they gave me an opportunity to go back there. And to be honest, that decision is the whole reason that I'm sitting here now because I got there and the one thing that I gravitated to when I got there was they run this Entrepreneur of the Year program globally and I put up my hand, loved the whole idea, got to meet all these incredible entrepreneurs and, you know, you and your dad in, I think, what was it, 2003? Yeah, I think it was just after the Olympics. Yeah, yeah two, three, I think it was yeah. 2003. Anyway, you guys, Vix was was part of the Entrepreneur of the Year program, and you know, it it, it really did change the the course of my life. I you know had the great fortune of of hosting you you and your dad through that program, and and then came and did a year's work for you the following year, like with the intention of being here longer yeah. term, but wrong role, wrong time, wrong, you know, the, the business was raw and, you know, I still had that, I suppose, naive attraction to the city and then because corporate life's easy. Yeah. Like <laughs> corporate life's fucking easy. You get oh. paid incredibly well. Yeah. You wear a nice suit. You work in an office overlooking the harbour. There's pretty girls everywhere. Like for me, it was the the drawback to that as opposed to, 
knuckling down with you guys when you were the the wild west of the the meat industry was just it was it was too easy to 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 refuse i want to just go back quickly because i'm fascinated by this this whole degree piece non-degree degree piece you know like how do you rationalize sort of you know your parents were highly educated yeah super successful doctors you went to a private school obviously it was almost um guaranteed that you sort of go and finish a degree because yeah. that's what you had to do or told to do. I finished a degree. We know a lot of people that haven't gone on to tertiary studies who are ultra successful, super successful. Mm. You and I sort of joke about the fact that the world doesn't need any more lawyers, doctors, uh, yeah. accountants or whatever, but what we need is, you know, farmers and amazing producers and and all that sort of stuff. How do you personally sort of rationalise this this going to school, getting a degree, how you sort of come out of that whole process as opposed to, you know, I don't know, just not going and doing a degree and mm. becoming a grafter and sort of working your, your your way up from the bottom up type thing. Like do you have a view and all that sort of stuff on, on that? Because you, you, you know a lot of people that both have degrees and don't, don't have degrees. Yeah, and, no, it's true. And I've got, I've got, I've got two and they're contradicting – feelings about and views on it. One is that I think for most people, particularly if you're business minded, that going to university, all it does for you is teach you to learn more, you know, and does it make your brain stronger? Does it make it think differently? Perhaps. Um, but it seems like a very expensive way of of getting some basic knowledge, you know, back to podcasting, you know, fuck, I'd much rather learn by listening to unbelievable human beings that have done interesting things. So that's one part of me I actually don't believe for most people, unless you need to be a doctor or an engineer where, you know, we want those people to be highly educated. There's a the process they need to go through. Um, and for me, I would, I would much rather have met a person like you when I was 18 and just be guided or a Jerry Harvey or someone like that and, and being taken under their wings and just learnt from the grassroots up. Um, that's one part of it for me. And the, the, the contrary part is that for a lot of kids, you know, you've got kids that have just left school or about to leave school that don't necessarily know what they want to do. And if they're willing to work hard and go to university and use it as an experience to develop more as a human being, meet more friends, get more exposure to part-time work, dipping their toes in there and they're prepared to ultimately pay for that education and not expect their parents to pay for it, then I think there's benefit in doing that too. Like I'm, I'm old enough not to be binary and say, fuck education, it's just an expensive trap and the biggest debt that Australia, the US and most other global country our first world countries have is is student loans etc um i'm just not that way minded but i i, I think each to their own type each stuff. to their own and and if it's four years where you do nothing but have fun and chase girls chase boys drink party but you know respect that you you're getting an education too then Life's about experiences, man. It's not just about who gets to the, the finish line fastest and who gets richest fastest and who becomes a doctor and all that bullshit that, that all of us are raised to think that's the only way to do things. And if you have the opportunity, then I think it's great for a lot of people. So you joined Ernst & Young. You tapped into this, the whole entrepreneurial side of things through the entrepreneurial year program that we were, they were running. You and I met. I didn't win which I'm still bummed about. The only saving grace is that everybody else in my category has gone broke. Gone broke and I'm still standing. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long were you there? What you, what were you doing and, and what came next? I did five years at EY in their corporate tax. Um, and fuck, man, taxes. I'd much rather study to be a doctor than try and learn the – Australian corporate tax, it was not only dry and complicated, but it was just laborious and changed all the time. But the good thing for me was you got exposure to incredible companies. You know, a business like Ernst & Young has clients that are some of the biggest people in the world, the extraders, through to some of the most dynamic, like um, Manildra, as an example, that I had the good fortune of 
of being really close to to Dick Honan. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it was dry, mate. I was never going to stay there. Like, and perhaps Vix was the the gateway drug to the the next chapter. Um, so yeah, mate, it was corporate tax, and and then came here and tried to be your CFO for a while, thinking that you can go from being a corporate tax accountant to being a, a CFO. And, you know, it's probably the thing that I sit here now with wisdom and and look at what you, what business people need in a CFO. And I think people are underestimate how important that role is and whether you actually need it. You know, a bit like us, we now have a COO that has a, a very strong financial experience yeah, and yeah. background and things and for a lot of people that operational skill and and just having finance people on the side to to do the the more compliance and and analytical stuff can be a a, a really good balance you know obviously you get big corporates and things and they need all of those those resources okay next and then i went back so from here when i left fix in 2005 I think it was just before you you chuffed off to China so I could have stayed and stop you blowing up all that money and (laughs) (laughs) could have been my last gift to you man um I went back to banking a partner that I worked for at Ernst & Young um interestingly because not many partners leave because they work so hard to get there and they get very they get paid very well and he wanted out, um, a great guy by the name of Peter Shear, and he went across to HBOS, which was Halifax Bank of Scotland, that had come to Australia and they owned Bank West and a couple of other retail-facing businesses, wealth management and stuff, but they wanted to have a really big go at the um, private equity market here in Australia. Um, they were one of the, pardon me, one of the biggest lenders to private equity in the UK, and and they were on this incredible growth spurt. And so I went across there and, and joined their relationship management team, um, which basically means there was a group of guys that did the deals and then we managed the asset while the private equity houses owned the business. And without doubt, it was the most dynamic, exciting job until what we're doing now. But one of the greatest opportunities in my life, you know, because I was dealing with some of the the biggest and best private equity firms in the country, you know, some of the global ones from KKR, but more for me, the the mid-tier ones like the Quadrants with George Penklis and Chris Hadley and Ironbridge and Archer and those guys. And they were buying everything from Godfrey's through to Rebel Sport. They had a crack at, at Qantas at one stage. It was just the jewellery group. It was this unbelievable journey of dynamic fast dynamic pace, a lot of money being thrown around yeah, yeah. W- bad place in the food chain because those private equity guys and i've still got a bunch of mates that, that that work in there and they're without doubt some of the smartest dudes i've i've ever met in my life but they 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 were the ones that that made all the serious money but incredibly dynamic you know and even to, to this day you know we talk about mrs crockett's kitchens which had been bought by Ironbridge Private Equity. And from memory, it was $104 million they bought from the the George brothers up in, in Brisbane. And they had a listeria outbreak soon after they bought the business. Coles and Woolies were their two, really their two only customers. And Woolies just pulled the, the rug from under them. And, and we had 70 odd million dollars of debt in that business. And collectively, three years later, we sold it to Jack Cowan of um, Hungry Jacks, Hungry Jacks mm-hmm. for three million dollars. Wow. So hundred and hundred and one million dollars blown up in value over the course of three years. And the lessons that came out of some of those really harsh people paying dumb money for paying dumb money, paying stupid money, and using dumb banker money just with debt fueled growth. Um, until the GFC hit and then the the music stopped for a long period. So went through that unbelievably painful exercise of we literally went broke. Like okay. we, we couldn't raise money to fund our customers. So um, we sold Bankwest to CBA. They stole it from us. Uh, Lloyd's, the, the big banking group from the UK, came in over the top and bought um, HBOS. Um, realizing that they'd bought a pretty toxic asset and 
and then Her Royal Majesty came over the top and salvaged the bank. So it went from being an incredibly dynamic organization to one that was just not only massive but heavenly governed because it had, you know, federal money in it. And and they they it was very clear to me that they were on a a path to get out of the Australian market. But it was also interesting because I was senior enough to to have a seat at the table at all discussions. So we worked for, for quite a while, stopped doing private equity largely, you know, supported our existing customers, but then started doing corporate lending to the likes of Sydney Airports and Arium, which was um, One Steel and um, Brambles and all the big corporates. But for me, that was so dull and boring. You know, still earned great money in those things, but it was – Private equity was so exciting because you're really close to the fire. You're around entrepreneurs and it was exciting. And so when I started doing the corporate stuff, I was super grateful that- Is that when you left? I didn't leave, man. I stayed to the death. I turned okay. off the lights. So the business got sold to, and I was part of that process, to Westpac at the end of 2013. Um, I stayed all the way through till then. Um, then one of my younger brothers got married at the end of 2013. My mum was super close. She had uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and was on her last legs. I said good- goodbye to her and just packed up and decided I was going to go and surf and ski and ride motorbikes around North and South America. And And I did that until I got the call from my dad saying, I don't want you to come home, but I just want you to know that I don't think your mother's going to last that much longer. And so I went back home. When was that? Mid-2014. Okay. You know, so I did that, came back, and the whole family was with mum when when she passed, which was both sad and, you know, it was a, it was a relief. My mum was the, the youngest female doctor in Sydney when she graduated. She was an incredible human being and and she suffered grossly for the for the last 10 years of her life so the six or seven months that you took off yeah was that just to cleanse man cleanse let your hair down you don't have any hair but yeah just to cleanse and just have have a bit of fun and travel and all that sort of stuff yeah i i we i worked really hard ap for those i'd worked really hard for a long time but you know the opportunity got paid out well and I really didn't want to go back into corporate, you know, a bunch of my mates from banking were looking at jobs and I still had that unfinished business with being in what I thought I wanted to be, which was an entrepreneur. And so I wanted to travel and expose myself to some some other people, but also, you know, do three things that I really love doing, surfing, skiing and, and riding motorbikes. And so I just did that, man. Had the opportunity to do it, and it was it was unbelievable. Your mother passes away, mm. um, and I can tell there's a lump in your throat just talking about it. Obviously, someone you loved and who mm. loved you, and mm. what happened after that? Did did that whole experience change you, or change the way you thought, or how did you sort of pivot out of that? What did you do next? It's a good question again, AP, and and. I hate cliches and shit, and but I definitely did sit at my mum's funeral and think because I I when I worked in corporate I was just a smoking, boozing, womanizing rat bag, you know, like nice rat bag, but a, <laughs> a rat bag all the same, respectful yeah. all, always. And but I sat there at my mum's funeral and said, but even even the work, you know, like you're a fucking banker. Like, don't kid yourself that you're really doing anything that great for for the world or really utilizing your God given talents. And so I did sit there at Mum's funeral and say, I'm not going back to corporate, and I'm going to do something more noble, and I'm going to be a better human being. You know, however much that needle moved, I'm I'm not sure, but that that was my intention, and I had invested um, a way too much money in a, a startup called Nev House, which, you know, had this opportunity to do some incredible things. They they make prefabricated homes out of recycled plastic and timber um, intended for third world countries, you know, countries that, that typically have an enormous number of people that that don't have homes. And I even packed up and because they invited me midway about September in 2014 to come and 
and join them. They were based in Bali and it all sounded fun and romantic and, and I went over and, and spent a month there and came back here and raised some more money for them. But before I allowed that money to go, I already had a boot full of mine, but I raised some money through family and friends. And before I allowed that money to go into that business, I had some grave reservations about the CEO and the nepotism that was going around it. And I called the company's bluff on it and, you know, walked away because they they refused to. And I just said, well, thankfully, I, I never let anyone's money go into it other than my own. And How long did it take before you sort of sniffed a problem? and Three months. And, and interestingly, the company is still on life support. It has taken down so many good people. Like... Sally Fitzgibbon, the, the pro surfer, the Australian pro surfer, her old man, Russell, terrific fucking guy. Like I've only met him a couple of times, but he invested his and much of his family's life savings into it. Is that the first time you, and obviously took a, a, a big chunk of your own Equity. personal wealth. Yep. Was that the first time you'd ever been bitten, lost a big chunk of money? Yep, yep. On an investment or whatever yep. it might be? And how'd that feel? How'd that feel like? I was still reasonably philosophical because I was single. I, you know, I had adjusted my lifestyle and I still had some money in the bank. And so I was like, fuck it. You know, it's just all part of it. I, bad decision. Bad decision. Cut my losses. And there was still on. a couple of really good people. There, there still are a couple of really good people trying to, to bring it about. Like I have zero hope in, in ever salvaging one cent from it. I, th- I think the, the horse has bolted. But I still had this belief that there was something bigger out there and um, I stupidly invested a bootful more money in, in something else that I thought was safer but still dynamic and in a space that I thought I knew really well being Surf Stitch, which is the, the largest online surf retailer in the world at, at that point in time and, you know, again, invested a significant six-figure amount of money into that business. It, it had been listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. It was at one point worth $500 million. And and the the founders of that business, you know, one of them, and I'll say this publicly, was just a, a dishonest rat bag. And that business quickly unraveled and went into receivership and it's it still exists. It's a great business. You know, the core of it was great, but they bought a bunch of assets, Garage Entertainment and FCS and a bunch of non-core assets and just lost their way. Like a really good lesson for people in business that get romantic about having a pot full of money and just going out there and, and you know, thinking they're going to become the Amazon of Amazon Prime of, mm. of, of the surf industry. So have you noticed a lot of that over your career that – um what – there's a bit of consistency in terms of people getting unstuck. They're successful in one field, their chosen field, what yep. they're passionate about, what they know, all that sort of stuff. And then they go, oh, you know, I'll, I'll have a crack at this, I'll have a go at this and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, they're not. Yeah. I, I, I think it's less about that for me and it's more about everything that I've seen go bad has been the person at the top. Okay. Like without doubt, it's the jockey, not the horse. Yep. You know, that you can have a average company with a great leader and the business will do really well. You can have a great business with a bad leader and a particularly a dishonest leader and it's got fucking no hope. Interesting. And, and yeah, that's, that's how I look at it, man. Like I just, I, I would never, ever invest in something again without intimately understanding the, the, the C-suite. So two back-to-back sort of learnings, failures. Was there a third or? I, I no more investments of actual chunks of investment, but I, I'd been involved with SurfAid for a long time, which is a, an amazing charity that does all the work up in, in the Mentawai Islands in well, even further afield these days. But originally – the Mentua Islands in um, Sumatra where the Boxing Day tsunami came through and had sat on the Ambassadors Council for for that charity for a long time, knew Dr. Dave, the founder, very well and a bunch of other people. And Dave was, I think he was 57, 58, and he came to me because I became really interested when mum died in, in the whole corporate health care space and 
thought there was an opportunity to do something there and you know maybe this answers your question in in a minute um or well, what you asked just a moment ago and so tried to build a corporate healthcare business um with dr dave but i funded the whole thing you know so i invested over the course of the year in terms of my own living expenses and mm -hmm. developing websites and running pilot programs and buying equipment and and those kinds of things over an 18 month period you know blew up a, a chunk more money and you know then got to the end of that it was almost three years since i'd i'd earned a cent and you know the the well was <laughs> well and truly running dry and and was at that interesting crossroads where i still didn't want to go back to corporate although I said stupidly before I left corporate that I'll get down to my last dollar before I consider going back. And you were literally there. I was literally. I went over, man. Okay. I literally went past it. Like I went to my old man and borrowed a hundred thousand dollars. Like I, I'll, I'll never go bankrupt. I, 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 I don't like people that do. I think it's weak. I think it just. It takes people down, and you know, you just wash your hands and don't do what what is right and so you know god bless my old man he he lent me the money and and then i had to make the decision what i was going to do and and it was for me that point that i made before it wasn't going to be about the business it was going to be about the jockey you know so i created a short list of people that i thought were fucking unbelievable business people the people that i th wished i had met when i was 18 years of age and this was a super ambitious lift because it had it listed <laughs> it had it had Zuckerberg, it had Jeff Bezos, it had Elon Musk, and and then it had Anthony Baharich on it. You which know, is, um, flattering, Shory. Before we before we get to that point, which brings us, I suppose, to the present day. Yeah, I'm just going to take my jacket off while you talk. Okay. Um, so just summarizing, okay, from my point of view and from everybody listening out there so a really normal lovely upbringing <clears throat> two great parents a private education university some great experiences travel some yep. great roles good times making some money meeting some great people mm. a couple of or well, three in quick succession bad sort of poor decisions, outcomes, whatever you want to call them. Yep. Like reflecting and looking back, what were the real highs, lows, how low were those lows, and more importantly, what are your major sort of learnings from the your life to date, you know? Kid, adult, mature adult, mm. successful, like, summarize it in a couple of sentences that's an interesting question man like i think my my greatest gift in life is one was given talent had a good brain was great at sport played first 15 gps first have done iron man can surf ski all that stuff every job i've done i've excelled at you know i've been married once and fucked it up i'm now married to the woman that I love most in the world. And I've always been able to, despite failures, see the good in the world and always have fire in my belly. Like I've never once sat in a role and gotten bored because if I couldn't fix it, then I just left. And maybe people think that that's flaky, but for for me, it's it's how life should be, that if you can't get up every morning and be passionate about how you view the world, how you look after yourself. Fuck, even if you're partying, like if you're going to party, you got to party hard. <laughs> like just just do things to to the best of your ability. And, and if it stops enriching your life, then you've got to either change your perspective or, or change your circumstances. And, you know, that's the way I've always looked at it until I got close to 50. You know, and then you start to realize that everything comes to an end, including life, you know, and I'd like to think that I'm halfway through life and there's, there's, there's the second half is going to be way better than the first half. But the opportunities that are afforded to you 
and particularly as a middle-aged white heterosexual guy become a really shallow pool yeah, well. you know it, it's true mm-hmm. you know i i have so much empathy for for guys that that have enormous responsibilities with families and things and lose their job in in mid-career you know at 50 between 50 and 60 and they still need to keep working because this whole minority employment that is seen as a, a great thing and there is elements of it that truly are great is really discriminatory to the group that gets the worst rap from everybody you know privileged white males yeah interesting you yeah. Know? um and so it got to that point where i was just prepared to come and do something with someone that i really believed in that even if it got so fucking hard it 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 it, it didn't worry me and it was it, it's the first time i've ever done something in my life where i was prepared to do it even if you had to go to war <laughs> you know and it's and it's interesting you know, and I'd imagine it's like that amazing, very, very famous book by um, The Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, you know, that you can do something that is unbelievably hard and find the the most joy, yeah. like the most joy. The harder it gets, as difficult as that can be in the moment, but it brings you the most satisfaction and the most joy. And, you know, I'm, I'm really blessed to be in that position in my life. Yeah, like that old... That other cliche, you know, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Type yeah, thing, and that's know. what it feels like. Yeah, two thousand and eighteen, big year for you. Um, you joined Vix Meat. Yep. Uh, you got married. Yeah. Oh, in this order, you joined Vix Meat. Yep. You turned fifty. Yep. You got married. Yep. Um, holy trilogy. The holy trilogy. Yeah, mm. the trifecta. Um, why? Why, why? I mean, it's a, it's an incredibly flattering list of people that you mentioned, mm. ultra successful, um, great business people, definitely the common thread that joins all of them, me included, without sounding arrogant, is this entrepreneurial sort of spirit and drive. You'd had a crack at VIX, you know, a dozen or so years earlier. Yeah. Like what is it about VIX meat? both the jockey and the horse because mm. they've got to be sort of somewhat both appealing yep. and attractive. What, yep. what was it, Shory? The jockey was it, it was an absolute, you know, the, you, you've done incredible things. And I don't just mean that as, as a businessman, as, as a pioneer. And, and in fact, as a businessman, I don't think you've done nearly enough. Like I don't think you've lived up to your own talent and, you know, we're, 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 we're remedying that at the moment. But in terms of what you've done for the industry, I don't think there's anyone that, that certainly in this country that has done that. And I think being around that kind of opportunity, but also being very real about it and, and understanding that to truly unlock your potential and the business's potential there, they're required different people in your business and you know perhaps not with a very deliberate intention of of what 15 18 months later has has transpired but the the foundations of this business and and what it was needed shaking to the core and the opportunity to be part of that with a vehicle that was reasonably safe but still as i always say this is just a a, a turnover with umpteen million dollars of turnover like it has as many problems as a turnover and it has as many opportunities as a turnover and you know the 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 chance to work side by side which you know initially i wasn't you, know, you said you're not going to get to work with me initially and i said okay no problem <laughs> i knew i could change that super quickly yeah. <laughs> um so yeah mate it was it was the opportunity it, we, 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 without doubt and and you're right like I do genuinely love the hospitality industry you know as a, a rank outsider and I do I feel like an imposter yeah. you know through you I get to meet all of these unbelievably incredible chefs and producers and things but 
I'm not driven by that as much as I love and appreciate it and I'm inspired by it. I'm I'm absolutely driven by how we unlock the the value of this business and and really enable you to achieve what um, I really think is is your absolute right. Just the last seventeen months, mm. uh, they've gone quickly. Yeah, we've done a lot. Yeah, there's been, as there always is. Uh, a lot of highs, a few lows. Mm-hmm. Um, for those people out there who, you know, uh, know the business, um, you know, buy from the business, whether it's a chef or the general public, you know, Vic Smead has always had this beautiful, very highly polished um, exterior. Mm. Give them a bit of an insight in terms of, working for this business because the idea of working for Vic Smeat mm. sounds super attractive to a lot of people and I'm always humbled by the number of people that reach out and say, you know, I love your business, I love your brand. Uh, what you guys do is so interesting, exciting, so innovative. Mm. Um, and even, you know, it's, it's to be honest with you, it's one of the sort of the interview questions that I now sort of slot in, um, which is, you know, like, you, you know, the idea of working for, for this business is not necessarily the same as sort of what it's like once you're in this business, you know, how mm. appealing and attractive. Like give everyone a bit of a, an insight in terms of what it's like to be a part of this great business, you know, but yeah. the good, the bad uh, uh, and everything in between. Yeah. Everyone knows the good, you know, and I think the – the the reputation that the business has and the quality of the product that the, the the business has and the relationships that you and your dad have with chefs and suppliers and things is well documented from TV shows to books and things and that's all good. I think the biggest problem with the business and it was so obvious, it was obvious to me 15 years ago and it was certainly obvious to me having then spent 10 years with private equity people that are all about building frameworks around businesses so that when the key man's not there, it doesn't fall down was exactly that, that no disrespect to your dad, but this business had been built by your determination, your vision, your hunger, your incredible work ethic. And every time you got distracted with another project or went on holidays or even went home, then the energy and the discipline and the structure of the of the business went went out the window and we had a bunch of sales reps as we used to call them out there and and these incredibly important chefs would just get the shits with them because they didn't know what they were doing they cared a lot but they weren't you and no one had taught them how to be you and you know, so there was this culture externally that was brilliant, but there was a culture internally that was just organized chaos. And from 12 o'clock each night until 6 o'clock the following night, it was just get those orders <laughs> out the door and, and, and it was just all on adrenaline. But, you know, Ray Kroc or any of those guys that have built scalable businesses would just look and say, it's it's absolute madness. And we need to retrofit culture, like true culture. You know, it's the whole reason why we've made, I think it's over 20 people over the course of the last 15 months redundant is that sometimes you've got to let people go even if it's, it's really damaging to the business in the short term because they just don't culturally fit what we are. And, um, and we've probably 10% along on a, on a 100% journey to – to do that and we've done it the right way around we've realized that our customers are the most important people and you know we probably haven't been super smooth in how we've done it but we've we've gotten rid of some rms and we've upskilled the rest of them and there is now a framework around how they manage our important customers and i think our customers will start to see the benefits of that and the challenge is now for us is to do that to to the rest of the business so that it isn't all just dependent on you, that your DNA is always in this business, but no more so than Bill Gates is, is still in Microsoft. And and that's that's a challenge in, a, in an industry that still seems to want you to pick, pack, cut, sell, 
and and do all of that and 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 it's a little bit mad you know it's i think that's part of the excitement of this industry is that there needs to be change at every level and there needs to be changes in our chefs and how organized they are how healthy they are and there needs to be changes in when our people work so they don't have to work in a cold box overnight and you know we're 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 responsible for making those changes because I don't think anyone else in the industry is going to do it. You know, it's it seems to me as a again as an imposter that the industry is is full of opportunistic bottom feeders, and I don't mean that disrespectfully because I know there are some some really great people like Peter Andrews. Is it Peter at Andrews? Which one's yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, Peter, Peter Andrews, Andrews yeah. that you speak very highly of, and and I do mean no disrespect to any of those guys, but just this dumb, stupid idea of the the lowest price wins um just has to stop and so yeah mate it's it, it it's definitely not a bed of roses and there's there's literally blood on the floor in the factory and there's <laughs> as much blood on the floor in the in the offices upstairs here but we're we're in we're in a good position and we've we've walked away from a significant amount of, of revenue and we've taken that risk because it either wasn't profitable for us or it wasn't value aligned for us. And we're blessed to have some of the the biggest and most amazing customers in this industry, both here and, and Melbourne. And, and that's a pretty exciting proposition to, to take that five out of 10 scorecard that some of them have given us recently and get it to 10 in a, in a really short period of time because they believe in you enough to give you second, third, fourth chance at it. Yeah. I don't want to use up too many more though. No, no more. Um, some personal highlights over the last 17 months. There's been a bunch, you know, I think for, for me, it's more, the unlocking of my team, the RMs, seeing some of them leave because they just weren't up for it, which is all good. I, I encourage that. I think removing people from a business when it's not good for them is the best thing you can do for them sometimes, you know, um, and and certainly the ones that have stayed and and seeing them grow and develop is a, is a massive highlight. Uh, the The podcast is a big one. Um, the agreement to, I suppose, have some succession planning in the business and give your dad the opportunity to, to perhaps retire if that's what he wants to do and for Anita to, to go and take a break for a while and, and, and decide whether this is for her for the next five or 10 years, I think has been a good thing to, to see that happen. Um, the, very very clear vision that we've got and have developed for the next or out till 2025 you know which is as short as your high school career and the process that went into that and the people that were involved in that have, has been a, a, an absolute highlight so there, there's a lot mate but most of them are pretty granular and boring there's no milestones there's no five million dollar accounts that were brought in you know the well they were pretty close on a couple today so <laughs> You know, just little things, man, that, that are ultimately going to make a really big difference. Any surprises? I knew what this was like, man. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of people come in and see the beautiful offices we have here in Sydney and are, are very delusional about what needs to be done. But this is, as I said before, this is a startup and it, it has all the challenges and pains of a of a startup and it's it's just we're blessed with a, a really amazing customer base and and we do incredible things for them and so no surprises for me man and is there anything that um either professionally or personally sort of scares you about where you're headed personally and professionally you've hitched a you've hitched your ride to a pretty crazy roller coaster and you or my wife well both of us, probably me more than KB. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, like is there anything that you're sort of wary of? Is there anything that sort of – because you, you, you've joined the business at a, a really interesting time, mm. a really challenging time, yeah, a time when uh, we've had to redefine and defend who we are, go back mm. a couple of steps before we go forward. Yeah, It's also coincided with – 
the industry at large being under the most pressure that I've ever seen it in, my father's ever seen it in. Yeah. Um, anything that sort of worries you, concerns you. I think the only thing that that potentially worries me is that what we've decided to do, which I think most people would be incredibly surprised at just how unambitious and vanilla it, it really is. Like it's going back to the grassroots of what you and your dad and Anita did in the early days, which was just premium quality and incredible service that walking away from, for now at least, opportunities like this whole plant-based and cell-based meat that has cryptocurrency hysteria around it because it seems like a really good commercial opportunity. But when we've dug below the surface and, and discovered that it really is just a glorified Chico roll and that it's heavily processed and that it's encouraging monocropping farming and all the things that we are trying to walk away from and then we're looking to introduce something into the mix that, you know, just because it's a plant doesn't mean it's good for anything, you know, mm. and I think it's a whole other argument that I don't want to go down the rabbit hole on today. But I think just just that, AP, the, the, the business plan that we've developed for ourselves is precluding certain other opportunities. But that's also the thing that gives me most comfort that we're going to execute on it because it's, it's realistic, it's, it plays to our values, it plays to our strengths, it plays to everything that the business was built on and I just think it's, it's a masterstroke that we are the premium supplier, both food service and retailer of, of meat, you know, so. Real not, meat. Real meat. So we're not going to sell plant-based meat, you know, and if that disappoints a few people and we don't make, umpteen million dollars from it but we sit here and go we're doing it for a very good reason and if down the path that changes and we're able to develop a product that has organic polyculture agricultural inputs and it's the technology is there for us to do it then we, we would relook at it but for now i think people just need to be very aware that what they believe they're doing, whether it's good for the environment, good for themselves, or even good for, for the animals, is grand delusionment. Um, some lighthearted stuff to sort of finish up on. Nice. Um, I know this is going to be tough because we've had an eclectic and amazing bunch of people give up their time to be a part of this podcast. Yeah. Um, but from you listening back and being a listener of, you know, the last 29 episodes. Yeah. Any favourites um, or a favourite and which one, for what reason? Um, there's 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 definitely lots of favourites. Like I, to be honest with you, I've, I've liked every single one of them. Um, they're, they're, they're amazing. They're all, for the vast majority, super serious people. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I mean, intensely yeah. serious. And I, and I mean that with respect. You know, everyone from Dr. Deron Scher to, to Lennox Hasty to um, the, the, oh, the girls from MLA were, were a little bit lighter. But then the boys last week, so Jake and Kenny from, from Mary's, were just a breath of fresh air. And not just because they're a bunch of lovable rogues, but just because there's so much more. And, you know, that's why we said substance over form with those guys. And then Jerry Harvey, you know, like it was like sitting here and talking to my old man when he's when he was drunk. When he's lecturing you. He was lecturing me yeah. and I was trying to explain to him that we're going to do online retail <laughs> and he said, son, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. And I go, but fuck, Jerry, what about Amazon? And he just would scream at me. So, yeah, I think those those guys, with no disrespect to any of them because I don't, I don't want to single them out, but the the ones that have been a little bit more – lighthearted where we've we've been able to have a beer and 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 just have a laugh and you know the humility of all three of those guys jake kenny and you know jerry that can blow up 120 million dollars and, and still smile about it still smile about it you know yeah so. there's there's been a lesson almost well not almost there's been a lesson in every single one of them no matter how simple that lesson or take home mm. has been or how complicated 
Um, the hardest one was Temple Grandin, though. Yeah, I was going to ask you what was the most challenging or the hardest. Yeah. Oh, that was remote. Remote uh, and, you know, Temple's got autism and the line wasn't that good. She was in Colorado, so she was probably stoned. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> so that, that was a super challenging one. But it was amazing. Like I, was, I felt really privileged that she she gave us the time and I hope we get an, an opportunity to, to do it face-to-face with her at some point. But outside of that, man, people have been incredible, opened their hearts and their time. And, you know, Pete Evans was a was a, was a crack up. He was – he's a, a super – philosophical and spiritual guy and like him or or loathe him he's 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 got a lot of goodness to add to the world he has a heap of goodness to add to the world and he's very innocent in terms of literally doesn't have an agenda Mm. he just does what what makes him feel good and feel happy and yeah definitely um it sort of stirred up uh a lot of conversation Mm. um this has been fun um I know that all of our listeners have enjoyed and will enjoy getting to know the voice that they tune into every fortnight. Mm. Every uh, week, man. Every, every week. week, every week, yeah. every week. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, listening to, to, to your voice and, and you've done an amazing job of hosting the podcast. It's been interesting to see, to be on the other side of um, mm. the table and doing the interviewing you can certainly get your job, have your job back because I don't know if I've, I'm up to it. <laughs> you've um, done good, man. You've done good. No, nah, but you've been amazing. Thank you, like all our other guests, opening up your heart uh, and letting us into your world and into your past and, and talking about the good and the bad because I think that's important in terms of people getting the absolute most out of these sort of podcasts and and, yeah. and being very open and transparent because mm. um, everybody can learn a lot from each other. Yeah. Um, but it's been awesome. It's been fun. Thank you, man. Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, you've done an amazing job and you're an incredible person to sort of work alongside and, and um, yeah, it's been fun. So thanks for your Thank time. Thank you, buddy. And, and thanks to everyone that listens to, you know, like the, there's incredible support out there and, and we don't take it for granted and, you know, we will continue to to thank all of you and, and hope you get a lot out of it. So thanks for having me, man. Cheers, cheers. On to the sober. On to the sober beers. Yeah. <laughs>